Well, we might think of bringing him back to play Dawn in gradual resolution. Or maybe for the role of chat in Franklin Place. As far as the other one's concerned, I don't see it. Agreed. Send in the next two, Mary. If you'd please take the two seats on the far side of this table. Welcome Richard Andrews and Sakura Kai. Representing Drakwell Media, I'm Jeff Candleston. And I'm Aika Amiko. As you both know, you've been called in this morning because after our having gone over your headshots, your resume, your video intos and demo reels. We think both of you might be right for several of our projects currently in pre-production. Before we get going, I'd like to apologize for any background noise. We're using our backup urban studio to better accommodate our fly-in auditioners. We'd like the two of you to assume and read some gender-specific parts. Let's begin with the scene at the head of the list from the screenplay House of the Brave Bulls by Anna Lambert, based upon her book of the same name. Sakura, you'll play Amaya Weiss, a Japanese-American heiress who's traveled to Spain to claim a ranch for breeding bulls. The ranch was unexpectedly left you by your late stepfather. She is being first time driven to her inherited property by the ranch for men, Robert Satiro. The car on the home stretch is confronted by four men on horseback and is just stopped. Robert exits the car and talks to the mounted men. Something wrong? Uh... Difficulty, senorita. Yet another bull, groomed for La Ventas Playa de Toros in Madrid, has suddenly died. The biggest bullfighting event of the year? A disease? Ah, uh, no, senorita. Killed. Intentionally. With a gun. A gun? For heaven's sake. And you just said, yet another? How many bulls are we talking here? So far, quatro, four, each groomed specifically for a major corda. Any suspect? I mean, who would go about shooting our most valuable bulls? Who indeed? Not everyone these days enjoys blood sport. Some think it inhuman, but whoever shot them, you can be certain we will find them. The ranch may be large, but it's nowhere large enough for killers to hide. Were they cute for food? The bulls, I mean. They were definitely not killed for food. And the ranch ants, they think the next victim may well be... You! Moving on to the second scene, this one from the screenplay, Assignment Gray Area, by W. Lambert III, based on his novel of the same name. Gray Area agent Peter Galvatson, in his determination to locate Severan Wild, Tapson Chiaki, Svengard's Amsterdam Red Light District window. He catches Chiaki's attention by flashing a wad of paper money in front of the window. Begin, whenever you're ready. 
you here to share some of the big word of your art with me? You could definitely come out of this richer than when I first tapped on your window pane. Come in then, and let's move into the back room, unless you are seeing it exhibition item. So, do you have something particular in mind? Or have you confidence enough in my skills to let me improvise? I know exactly what I want. Which is? I need you to tell me everything you know about Severin Wilde, specifically where he's holed up as of late. Ooh. Well, maybe this photograph will refresh your failing memory. Wait, you are a, a private investigator? Merely a man interested in finding out where Severn has taken to hiding. Wish I could be of help. You but... can save us both a lot of time, Miss Vanguard. Uh huh. So you think I'm Chiaki Savandar? You're saying you're not? Dead? Just moved on. You know, of course. They are brother and sister. Just tell me where they moved. They are my brother and sister. Moving on to scene three. This one from the screenplay Riders of the Dragon by Christopher Dane based upon his novel of the same name. Mamu, sorceress, is on the verge of summoning a particular demon to do her bidding. Bidding whenever you are ready. I seek counsel to begin my journey into the void beyond. I seek assistance from a great one to open the door and guide me. You alone possess the key necessary to leave your mortal fortress. Don't you think I know that city? What I really need to know right now is who is speaking and if you will be my guide. I am the Tintinalia Frego. And I've come a good way to end up discussing the fine points of invoking the darkest of dark magic. And yet, here you are inside my sanctuary without protective servant or guard. And why would I bring them to protect me from you? Still, to humor you, I will confirm that I've come alone, though... You certainly must know that in my own full personage, I bring with me more than enough authority and power to instantly and utterly destroy you, which I will, should you continue to make further arguments or waste any more of my time. So not it. The key, then. Show me the key. And so it is, and so shall it be. You and I now exist outside of the world, completely alone in the void. And having brought you here, I have a question. Though admittedly for you, it will undoubtedly prove a decidedly unpleasant demand. Moving on to script four, please. This one from the screenplay Ascending in Pinstripes by author Lambert Wilhelm based on his book of the same name. Di Johnson discusses her husband's latest step back in social climbing with her husband, influential and powerful businessman boss, Mark Herfield. You do remember why I'm here, don't you? You're here about your husband and his setback as regards membership in the Devonshire Social Club. The competition was particularly stiff this go-round. Because of rich, handsome Charles Goldman, you mean? The homosexual, really? Not a homosexual, my dear. A bisexual. The club strongly values diversity. Your husband, unfortunately, has a reputation of being purely white bread and boring to boot. 
In fact, if he knew what goes on at the club, I suspect he would never have entertained becoming a member. But of course, we all know it was actually you who wanted to join. I could have easily made him appear more sexually by birth. He's quite malleable. Ah, oh, die, die, die. I've no doubt at all that you would have been welcomed into the club. It's unfortunate we don't admit singles, but we both know he wouldn't fit in. Please don't attempt to make me feel guilty for voting the way I did, especially since I've always liked him. Have a decided soft spot, even actual admiration for his sticking to his morals. But in this particular instance, those who don't play by Devonshire rules aren't included. And don't try to tell me you didn't know that from the get-go. What if I could persuade him otherwise? Are you asking me and the other club members to give him a second chance? The membership is hosting old men and wife this weekend to see if they fit in. How about inviting my husband and I? Hmm. Okay, consider yourself officially invited by me. Quite frankly, Charles' wife isn't as enthusiastic a party goer as I personally favor. But her husband still got your initial vote. Still, did you hear correctly that I have you a go ahead to bring my husband on Saturday? With the caveat he'll participate and not just watch. And even if I'm convinced by his miraculous conversion and veto Charles, I can exercise in the end only one vote, though I am chairman of the membership committee and the property owner. Then just you give my husband to me. Thank you, Richard, Sakura. You've done very well so far. Only two more scenes to go. Taking up now with scene five, exerted from the screenplay Adonis, written by William J. Lambert III, based upon his novel of the same name. Adonis Tyler, Private Eye, investigates a case in which a large prehistoric rodent is found dead, leaving the mysteries of by whom and why. Hiko Wright has turned up on Adonis' doorstep early morning with possible answers to the unanswered questions. Begin whenever you are ready. I've come to tell you about the rat. If that's the case, please come in. A filthy creature, the rat that would bring no one any good. No good at all. It killed my lover. By all means, do go on. I bet they never told you about me. Kiko right. Of course they didn't. And your lover? Jessica Pine. You heard nothing about her either. Right? She died pretty much unknown. Though in reality, it was she who first found the rodent. I was under the impression that Dr. Wims discovered the rat. The whole world is under the impression that he and his friends discovered a healthy creature. But I'm telling you, it was Jessica, not Dr. Wims, who brought that healthy creature to light. The inhabitants of an isolated island used to mix their saliva with urine to make a horrific dream, one that turns blisters into the mindless victims, they would feed to the rat. Now it's dead. It's dead. And I'm glad. Consider me down as a prime suspect, if you wish. 
I had the pleasure of watching that ugly thing fall dead into its own pool of blood and guts. Do you really think it possible for me to rip it inside out? I could have easy, but I didn't. Believe me or not, that thing had a kind of power. It took a long, painful time to die. But it was nothing to the pain I've known. Could you possibly get me a drink to make me forget? Thank you. You look so attractive and useful while I look old and weather beat. Laugh and talk, that's me, like sandpaper. But Jessica, she loved me just the same. That's what made her so special. She wanted me, even though I look old. No one of that mattered to her. She was beautiful like you, yet she loved me. You can't know how special I feel with a face and body like yours. You clearly had your share of women and men too. But what about Kiko Wright? Just one found me attractive. Just one, one out of the countless many, just Jessica, and now she's gone. Do you understand now how I could have killed that hefty rodent with my bare hands? This is very good to care, by the way. Unknown caller. They are calling to tell you their precious rats gone. Disappear, Bernice. I think the rat is missing. Of course it is. I told you so. But what would anyone want with a disemboweled dead rat? I'm burying Jessica tomorrow. I'm giving her the proper burial she deserves. Don't. Understand? But then, you don't know the whole story. If you do, but if you knew, that drink was really delightful. Cognac, was it? And very expensive cognac by its taste. Just what exactly is it that you want, Miss Wright? I want you to tell them to stop searching for the beast. But they have every right. They have no right. I, on the other hand, have every right. If you prefer, tell them it's out of respect as I'm burying my wife. Tell them if they persist, I would make things very, very ugly for them. And what about me in the investigation? Oh, but you'll go on with it. And eventually, because of your skills, you'll find who is secretly hiding the rodent's remains. So you can shake their hands? Did I tell you they worshipped that rat on that wretched island? Right out of a horror movie, complete with human sacrifices. The modern day savages who just called you are the ones who fed my Jessica to that beast. Like a sacrificial goat, they fed her alive, piece by piece, to the rodent. I shall marry Jessica tomorrow. Rather, I shall marry what left of her. And you, Mr. Tyler, will find out for me who among these men is responsible. And what exactly will you do with this information? 
No shake the killer's hand. I assure you. Whoever it has something, I must have. And that is? I want to be wearing all of Jessica tomorrow, Mr. Tyler. For that, I need the body of the rat. Excellent. So, proceeding with this last one from the screenplay Demon's Stock, written by William J. Lambert III, based upon his novel of the same name. Young and handsome Etienne Defarge is missing. Anthony Sink, spiriaturist, Masako Pence knows Etienne's where about and confront her after forcing his way into her mansion. Masako, wouldn't you know that I'd find you cross-legged and naked on the bare floor, attempting to conjure up God only knows what? Is that really the ceremony of the 16th candle that you're attempting? Please tell me you're just practicing, <laughs> though you and I both know better. Better? How about you tell me where Etienne disappeared to when I turned my head at the party? And don't think you're going to put me off with this conjuring up. It reminds me of the time I stayed awake all night mumbling incantations with you. When all of the while hiding from me that he was off in Athens, shacked up with some brat. I could have killed you for that, Masako. Despite all we've been through together. Looking back, I definitely should have. Anthony? Ah, uh, come out of it, Masako. The light hurts my eyes. Please turn off the light. Why should I put you out of any misery? Suffer, Masako, suffer. Anthony, is that you? Disappointed? Expecting someone else? Like Almighty Anoroth, perhaps? I mean, 16 candles and all. You don't need 16 candles to summon me. You only had to pick up the phone. And why conjure the dark side? Would you please turn off the light? The light, Anthony. It hurts my eyes. I can, but first, I want to know where Etienne disappeared to this time. Did you encourage him off again? The light, Anthony. Please, turn it off. You'd think I set the sun loose in this room, rather than just having flipped on a light. Please, Anthony. You know how sensitive my eyes are bearing a session. I'll turn off the light, and you are going to answer my questions. Where was I, Anthony? You were sitting quite naked in the middle of the floor, amidst your flickering red, black, and white candles, Masako. And that's where you still are. Why did you come? Why did you interrupt? You know the danger interrupting a conjuring. I know the danger, and I know it well. It'd serve you right if you awoke somewhere in hell with no way back. Do you think I'd give a shit? Surely that's not you speaking. Athens. All the time he was in Athens with a woman. You knew all that time. Why couldn't you just tell me? He wanted to be alone. Then why couldn't he have told me? He did, Anthony. He told you the only way he knew how. How was it my responsibility to inform you when he wanted to be alone? Had he wanted you to know, he would have told you where he was going or send you word after he'd gotten there. The pain answered me. If you only knew the pain, you wouldn't make me suffer so. Don't you dare speak to me of suffering. Do you know how much suffering you could have saved me? You and Etienne are bad for each other. I saw it from the beginning. I thought he'd see it too. 
I thought that was why he left the first time. Who are you to tell me what's good for me? You are neither my doctor nor my confessor. Turn off the light. Turn them off yourself. Don't get me more upset than I already am. It's easy for you to joke about my not returning from the trance, about my wandering forever through hell. What if your interruption had actually left me in limbo? You would have endangered my life as well as ATN's. Then you do know something about him and where he is. If we are going to continue this conversation, would you please turn off the light? If I'm forced to turn them off, there will be no more talk. Not now. Not ever. There. Are you happy? I will be if you will now close your eyes for a moment. I think I'll keep them open. I didn't catch the color of that 16th candle. Was it white or black, Osaka? Don't be vulgar, Anthony. You did something very dangerous tonight, acting like a jealous, sex stuffed bat. Well, you're the one naked in the middle of 16 candles. Why shouldn't I perform the light of the 16th candle? Who are you to say otherwise? Who are you to question anything I do? Who am I? Who are you? You almost got us all killed at Feline. And now you're doing a ritual more advanced than any of us has ever attempted. Why shouldn't I ask? Why shouldn't I question? Why shouldn't I wonder after the color of that 16th candle? And what if I told you it was white? White? What so? What were you trying to conjure? Perhaps it would be better to discuss this another time. I think it's best if you leave. I disagree. But first off, tell me where Etienne has gone. Why do you suspect I should know? As for me, I was merely tired of the party and went home. And Etienne? How should I know? We both know he has a mind of his own and does whatever he pleases, whenever he pleases. He's gone off before. What makes you think he didn't just up and leave again? I won't buy that. Not this time. If I told you I didn't give a damn whether you buy it or not? What if I told you that ATM just decided to leave and so left? It would be very unfortunate for you to try and lie your way out of this one. Why can't you keep your nose out of this? Why can't you just get it that he's gone off again? of his own free will. Why must you always meddle? Because I love him, that's why. Even after all this time, after all that's happened, I still love him. Love? <laughs> what do you know of love, Anthony? How many times did the two of you sleep together? Once? Surely no more than that. Do you think one lamp in the hay equals everlasting lamp? Face reality, Anthony. You are an old man. It is still in the flower of his youth. Every journey and John in the world is hot for him. Stop. Stop. Don't say another word. Wake up to reality, my dear Anthony. If you are not a fool, you are certainly acting like one. So, it won't last forever. Would you begrudge me the few precious minutes it might last? 
Do you be content with just those minutes? No, you wouldn't. You forget that I know you. You still expect the hours, the days, the years. Even after he tossed you into the nearest trash heap. How could you know either of us better than I do? Who are you to judge? It's not my judgment that's crowded. I can see past his body and your lust. I only know that I love him and that he loved me. Anthony, the etienne of this world are addicted to every sexy body that comes along. Don't flatter yourself into believing that he could ever be satisfied with one person. Just tell me where he is, Masako. Listen to me, Anthony. I read the horoscope for the three of us after feeling. Shall I tell you what the stars foretell? I only want you to tell me where he's gone. Disaster. All I saw was disaster. You become quite the fatalist these days. The stars are never wrong. Keep away from Etienne Anthony. You have been forewarned. I repeat, Misako, where has he gone? Choir House. He's gone to Choir House. Choir House? You've been warned. Don't cast this warning foolishly aside. Wait. It was you who spirited him away because you knew danger was waiting for me. I'm really not the old bitch you imagine me for, am I, Anthony? In reality, I'm quite fond of you and ATM. I'd like to see us safe together, but we are a fatal disaster just waiting to happen. When did you first realize? It was a string of coincidences. ATM arriving and invited to the ferry seance. The fact you'd never heard of Choir House. Then ATM's appearance at the cocktail party. I felt the same fatal connection as I do now. Interesting. But this, of course, changes nothing. I have to go to him. I can't let him face alone whatever is about to happen to him. But the Etienne won't be alone. Don't you see? The Etiens are never alone. There's always someone flattering about them, ready to protect them, ready to sacrifice for them. Like you, Masako? I told you, I was fond of you both. So, why not make one last try to bring us all together? Haven't you heard anything I've said? The stars predict death, multiple deaths. Then we'd all best pray that you and your forecasts are wrong. They weren't wrong at the ferry. Indeed, they were not. Well, what do you think? <laughs>